Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane, talking about all things in the landscapes of Arizona, uh, especially northern Arizona, this higher elevation. And and this week, we saw why the mountains of Arizona are different than anywhere else. We went from shorts weather, put the top down on the convertible and just hardly have any layers on, t-shirts are just fine, to... I can't put enough layers on. It's just cold. Put the extra blanket all on. Uh, let's 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 uh, bake cookies and and stay indoors today, honey. Kind of weather all within hours of each other, and that's that temperature swing. In the mountains of Arizona, you need plants that can take that type of temperature swing. It's unique. Uh, the the desert plants don't come close. They don't understand this temperature swing, much less. I think at our house, it got down to 14 degrees. In fact, I sent out, when was that? Monday, I think Monday, maybe it was Tuesday. Whenever that the front of that storm came through, I forget, time's been flying by, uh, a, a freeze alert to all of our core Waters Garden Center, you know, g- g- garden club. I just went, oh, this is fine. It's been so nice. People have been buying some flowers and putting some things out. Maybe they brought some of that borderline uh, uh, dicey kind of plants and they were doing just fine, but all of a sudden they could get zipped. And so for our house at the lane house, we brought the hanging baskets down, put them on the ground and the, the heat that's been retained in the, in the ground is that's enough, especially for a hanging basket of pansies or violas or kales. And then, uh, some things that were really borderline were like Lisa and I, we like to play with cactus. We've got some zone eight plants. We're a zone seven type of landscape. But on the front patio, it's it's retained block. It's 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 lots of pavers. It's lots of 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 reflective heat, and it holds that moisture and the heat in around that area. And it's a south facing, so it gets warm quick. We can grow zone eight plants, things that normally plants we need in the yard, or they go down to ten degrees. We might see single digits every once in a while, but again, this last storm, it was fourteen at our house. That's a zone seven. Uh, well, the zone eight plants, they wouldn't like that. These are plants that can go down to 15, 20 degrees going, okay, no problem. We'll put them up next to the house. So now we've got the heat from the uh, patio reflecting up and we put it next to the house. So the house is throwing off some heat. And then we threw a sheet over them just because I had some brand new, like red yucca, a barrel cactus kind of stuff that I'm playing with to see if they, how hardy are they? And they came through like a champ. So that was the warning that went out. You need plants that can take that. What we're finding now is, even with this cold front, hopefully this will slow things down. Aphids were going crazy. Hopefully this will slow them down. The fruit trees are budding up. Hopefully this cold weather will slow them down. The moisture is very good for the forest. Uh, So this was a good event to have because it was unseasonally warm. Well, now what I'm finding is things are starting to bud fast. So you'll need plants as they leaf out, as they flower out. You'll need plants that can take wind because as soon as this cold front's done, it'll start to warm up slowly. And there's this prevailing southwest wind that will hit. You saw a bit of that as at the leading edge of that storm. Well, if you get a storm coming through like that and these these ferocious winds with this new foliage, If you get a plant that's not used to it, it will leaf tear that tender new foliage. And so not all plants. This is critical for you folks coming from the Midwest. uh, Some of those low-lying areas that they're cold like this, but they're not used to the wind like this. This Your red leaf maples, they don't like this. Uh, they'll, They'll tear. So we try to go with our Autumn Blaze, Matadors, Celebrations, this whole series of red maples that love the wind. You need to make sure you plant the right ones. So you really want to do your homework because this week proved what kinds of plants will come through like a champ. Like I've got, uh, um, what is that? Daphne, sweet fragrance Daphne. You folks from the Northwest know what this is. It's this beautiful evergreen perennial 
and it's been planted in my outdoor gardens. It's been fine. Went through that storm. I didn't cover it, didn't do anything, and the buds still are about to erupt with these beautiful white flowers. It just fills that entire part of the garden up with that Daphne type of, of fragrance, even more fragrant than a lilac. Puts a rose to shame. It's, the fragrance is so sweet. It's that a cute little knee-high evergreen perennial. It's a great plant, but if planted in the right place, a little protection in the shade, it likes this cold weather. It's okay with this. What else is sort of like that? I would say in the in the summer months when that that radiant heat just comes down and it's dry and it's hot. There's some plants like your red maples, the red-leafed maples, the actual your Japanese maples. These are ones that do not like the, the heat that comes with that bit of wind in the mountains of Arizona. Yes, it says, the tag says, will grow and thrive in the outdoors. But, but no, not necessarily with our higher elevation. This sun is more intense. So you find you have to place them in just the right spot. Yes, we've got Japanese maples. We've got red barked Japanese maples. They're in. They'll grow in the mountains of Arizona. They'll do just fine when you place them in a shaded area. Let's say some morning sun's fine, uh, but but you don't want them in that midday right out there in the in in a rock lawn surrounded by heat in full sun south facing. They'll live there. The tag proves it. You know, the tag says it will grow here, but it'll be the ugliest plant. You'll be so unhappy with it because it will leaf scorch the the sun and this elevation just is hard on them. You put them in a little bit of shade, a north side of your house, they thrive. So that's the kind of, of plants you want out there right now. Right now, the, the planting teams, they are stacked up. They're two weeks out because all the evergreens came in. So these big Austrian pines, big Oregon green pines, you would get some beautiful, magnificent Diodor cedars. Great value, this full, fluffy, big plants, but they're big root balls. And so I was talking to the team leader of, of the planting crew here, here at Waters. I'm going, how is it? Are we seeing frost? Are we seeing, is it becoming a problem? Go, no, it's fine. We pick right through it. In fact, the soil's nice and loose. We're planting just fine. So I, I think you're okay as long as you're planting the right things. So I think fruit trees, this is a great time to be putting fruit trees in the ground. And I want to go over that maybe at the bottom in the last half of the hour of this hour, what kinds of fruit trees we're going into detail on that, how to plant them, how to get fruit. And there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. We're going to show you a few things I've learned over the years that really plays out. Makes, makes It's a game changer on, on what, what varieties, how many pollinators, all of that kind of stuff. What you can't grow and what you can grow. But you can put those in the ground right now. Evergreens, I would say... This is ideal time to put evergreens in the ground because they have, they're have they budded, but they haven't elongated that new candle growth. So you really want those, the ideal perfect planting time is put those evergreens in the ground before they start pushing their new candle growth. You can do it in April, but I would say it's ideal now because you, you just have no transplant shock. You can do it in April, May, when they're elongating, but they're, they're your error factor, you don't have as much fudge factor planted. You've got to be more exact. And as you get into June, you can still plant evergreens in June. In fact, junipers love it then. Arizona cypress, they love to be planted in June. But it's better to do it now. You, you, I would say you have to be an actual gardener to plant in the heat of summer. It can be done. Yeah, we're not that hot. We're not like Phoenix. But, you know, 89 degrees... That's hot for mountain folks. You folks in Williams, the White Mountains, the Flagstaff, you know, that's, that's blistering hot. Maybe not to your plants, uh, but, but it's, it's just changing from 70, what it was used to, to, to 90. That's a 20, 20 degree change. And so that change can mess with plants. You just have to be more exact with your, with your love uh, on that plant and that gardener's green thumb. You do it now, you can blunder your way through and it'll be just fine because it's going to wake up. It's going to root out. It's going to get used to it. It's going to slowly warm up. Uh, on our cycle that all the other plants are going on, it'll be fine. This is ideal, the perfect window. I'd say the next perfect window, 
October. That's as you're going into the cool, into the winter, that's your next peak windows for big evergreen plants. Got a lot in store, Lisa Waters Lane coming in. Studio right after this. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden Companion Plants of February are Peony, Calgary Carpet Juniper, Lily of the Valley, and Pinion Pines. Pinion Pine have thick evergreen needles providing year-round beauty and summer shade. It's a local native that blend equally well in a modern or Mediterranean-style landscape. Go ahead, enjoy the buttery rich pine nuts from your own backyard. You'll have plenty of nuts, and pine are deer and javelina proof. Shop the most trees in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is well pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and orderless. So we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we are back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane comes in each week with garden questions, just what's going on in your neighbor's yard. And then hopefully you can get a few tidbits and learn from there. Welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. Should we give the uh, good news to everyone? Of course we should. Yeah. You, you want to share it or that's kind of, you're glowing. I want to see how you say the name. (laughs) Okay. I wasn't going to go that far oh. so that people know <laughs> anyway. So we have a new grandson since Lisa's not going to share. <laughs> we just... I was because you never mind. Yes, we have a wonderful new grandson, our oldest daughter, Katie, and her husband, Jeremy. I uh, have a little boy. They are in Austin, Texas. So seven pounds, 11 ounces. How long? Oh, oh you know, I didn't even ask. I think 21. 21 inches. Think so? Yeah. You're making that up. No, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I know, you know, I live in this family too. I know things. <laughs> okay. When was he born? Uh, Tuesday of last week. The 13th. Yeah, there was we that go. Tuesday? Yeah. That was Monday. Wednesday was Valentine's Day. I know because I gave you a Valentine's gift. The Valentine's was Tuesday. Monday, the 13th. <laughs> I don't. No, you guys, you see how I go through life here. Do you have the same issues at home well, or is it just I'm me? I'm just saying Valentine's was on Tuesday. Okay. So we're going to Austin, Texas to visit him this week. Yes. So very fun. Bottom line. Yes. His name is Benicio. Benicio. Very good. Um, Benny or Nico. We haven't decided yet. Benny. I like that one. I don't know. I okay. don't care. They're going to decide. So... Probably true. Should we go with garden questions sure. or go in this banter? We're two minutes in and already cycling down hey, that's to. My fault. Uh, just... <laughs> okay, we'll start with Bruce in Prescott. So he noticed last week that he is getting some foxtails coming up in the yard. Oh, I'll bet. He sprayed them with weed killer and tried to get them taken care of. He wants to know is it too late at this point? For the pre-emergent, or he still has time to get it down? Yeah, that's actually a good question. So foxtail looks like a, a, a nice, beautiful green, Kelly green grass, like Ireland. It looks like that. And then it has this burr on it that turns into like, mm. only the devil will create this kind of grass. It's crazy. <laughs> and so it's not something you want. It, it has That's the one that has that seed head that goes through your socks, burrows into your ankle, or it... Uh, uh, it gets in the dog's eyes, their ears and nostrils, you know, vet bills, their feet pops. I mean, it's just it's nasty stuff. Mm-hmm. You don't want it. It's an annual. It only comes back by seed and it only comes back in the winter. And so it'll have a long season. It'll love this kind of moisture that we've had. It'll love the storm mm-hmm. coming through. It'll feed off of that and grow even worse. So, yes, you should kill off what you have. You can hoe them up. They're fairly shallow rooted. You could spray them. We've got Probably decimate would take them out pretty well. Uh, but yes, you are not done. Seed are still coming. There'll be waves of seed. So your question specifically, 
can you put weed and grass stopper down mm-hmm. now to prevent it from coming up any further? And so, yeah, get it on right now. If you have that, if you have weeds showing up, dandelions, foxtail right now, mm-hmm. um, that means you don't have weed and grass stopper down. You need, <laughs> you need it. So it's a no question, no brainer, because the goat head's coming right after the foxtail. Why are these all animal names? What is that? Goat head, foxtail, <laughs> whorehound. What is that? I never know. noticed that till right now. Think about that. I will. Okay. So there you go. Yes, you're okay to put it down now. Uh, even though it's snowing, whatever. Mm-hmm. Get that. Weed and grass stopper is a granular. It releases it when it gets moisture. So if we have a storm like this, get out there in the snow and the rain, put it down. And, and as that moisture melts, it'll, it'll, it'll go down and give you a barrier. So seed cannot get established mm-hmm. in your in your rock in your down your driveway down the fence line wherever it happens to be showing up. Mm-hmm. Okay, next question is from Cherry. She's out in Chino. She was pruning and cleaning up around her peach tree. She was cleaning around the base of the peach tree and noticed as she pulled leaf matter away that the bottom of the tree has a lot of orange sap coming Ooh, out of it. Good. Okay. Ooh. She wants to know what causes that yeah. and is it something that should be treated? Yeah, it's highly dangerous um, and it will kill your, your, they like pitted fruits. So peaches, obviously that's, uh, that's a, um, what's that called? Borer, peach, tree peach borer, borer peach tree borer. <laughs> that's it. But it can get into cherries and get apricots, right. plums, and they sort at the base. So my guess is, you had peach tree borer last fall. Mm-hmm. They started. They they started lay their eggs real low uh, to the ground, and so they've. It's a worm that hatches, comes out, burrows into the trunk, and then starts eating the wood underneath the bark. Mm-hmm. The only only way you know that is you'll see sap. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's early. That's it's not early because the ground is thawed. It's almost the, March. The, yeah, yeah, the the uh, sap is flowing right now. It just mm-hmm. means the trees are actively. Waking up. Produce, yeah, they're waking up. So I guess you're right on time. What to do? Is it dangerous? Yes, it's critically dangerous. You want to get on this right away, or it will kill that tree. What frequently what happens? The tree will actually flush out. It blooms, might even set flowers, searches the leaf, and then that first hot day in June collapses and in one day mm-hmm. just dies like that. You're going, well, what happened? What did I do? Well, it actually been eaten months before. This is the index. So you're catching it early. I would suggest to other folks that are tuned in, maybe check your pitted fruits as well so that you don't see the same thing. But any kind of bubble, weeping, sapping, that is not normal. You do not want it. And what do you treat it with? So I would treat the, the where you see that bark weeping. I would dab full strength some cyanara. Mm-hmm. There's a, it's a liquid spray that we have. It kills bugs. And, and I would take, usually what I would do is pull that sap back and you'll see a hole and take a paintbrush and try to dab it right smack dab on there. And then I would dilute it down to follow the directions and I would spray the entire tree down with that. And so that way it'll, it'll penetrate into the wood underneath the bark and where that worm is eating, it will kind of just, it just kills them. You want dead worms right. that are eaten on your tree. That's what I would start with. If you don't get fruit, I would even go so far as to put, uh, we've got a tree and shrub drench down Mm -hmm. that will actually taint the sap underneath it. That's really bad. You might even take pictures and bring it into us just so we can verify this rather than just one email. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this is critical. The tree will be lost unless you get on it. You can correct it. And then I would fertilize because as as it pushes that new ring of wood, it will, uh, it'll, it'll repair itself. It it can heal itself and get the pressure off of it. Okay. You cover it? We did. All right. Too <laughs> much information. No, just enough. Okay. All right. Dave and Prescott has Deodor cedars that have lost their color. Yeah, They're kind of a Dave. pale green going to yellow. Yeah. Uh, wants to know, hmm, should I just leave them until spring, see if they green up? Is there something I should be putting on them? Dave, it is spring. I mean, it's like two <laughs> weeks away. <laughs> yes, you should be doing this. So yes, you should be doing something. So that just means it wasn't fertilized enough last fall. So fertilize next October. And, and the new year, if you fertilize those two times, you have the richest, thickest, most glorious evergreens in the neighborhood. If you don't do that, they'll have yellow. They call it winter chlorosis. Uh, the plant actually leaves. In fact, it can lose some needles. It'll drop needles and things. So winter chlorosis is 
doesn't kill them, it just makes them not as healthy and your growth this next spring will not be as dramatic. So folks that, that nurtured to their evergreens will get more like, they'll get bluer, silvery blue on their juniper, on their uh, spruce, on their pines, on their, they'll get more growth on their Deodor cedars, uh, the Italian cypress, they'll be better. So you're gonna be, you're off just a step, but fertilize now. Okay. Uh, and then I would do it again. So really when you're fertilizing evergreens, here's how you do it. Fertilize uh, Easter, so spring, 4th of July, that's summer. We're taking advantage of the monsoon. Uh, Halloween is the absolute, fall feeding, the absolute most important feeding for anything, evergreens especially, and things that bloom in the spring, lilac, forsythia, quince, rhod rhodes, azaleas, all that kind of stuff, uh, camellias. And then for evergreens, fertilize in, in, at the new year. So again, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, and New Year's. And I'll bet you'll have, it won't be yellow next year. It'll green up faster this year. Um, that'll just kind of be your go-to. That's how you fertilize things. So you're saying fertilize now. That'll be your Easter feed. Yeah. Even though it's not Easter. You yeah. Get you close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Get you close. Ken and Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners. We'll be right back right after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Not everyone can grow wildflowers, but we'll make sure you're not one of them. At Waters, we know which wildflowers sprout, thrive, and bloom with success. We're wild about wildflowers with many of our own Arizona blends. Like our Arizona native mix, butterfly and hummingbird mixes, and all are big, bold, and beautiful. At Waters, we know wildflowers, and winter's a season to spread new seed. Waters Garden Center, where people who love their flowers wild, they love to shop for seed. We believe in picking apples and pears fresh from the tree at Waters Garden Center. Waters Garden Companions of February are Peony, Calgary Carpet Juniper, Pinion Pines, and Lily of the Valley. Lily of the Valley is a gorgeous shrub that loves growing in the summer shade. This bold evergreen delights with dramatic, fiery growth in spring. Fragrant wedding cake layers of white flowers hover on graceful, arching stems. Each dainty flower is utterly detestable to deer and javelina. Shop the most perennial shrubs in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. So I was out in the gardens taking a look at my wildflower seeds that I'd spread last month, and things haven't quite taken off yet. Shortly, I thought maybe since my peonies were coming up, starting to emerge, that my mums are starting to come up, they're already an inch or two tall, but maybe the seed would start going, but it's still a bit early, I realize. Usually it's a month of March sometime. You start to see the first leading uh, uh, seedlings starting to emerge. And then over the next, I don't know, month, two, three months, you start to see the flowers coming out. So it's more of a spring thing. It's just, I thought I'd check. I am taking all of my pine needles. So I was out there checking those. The pine trees have shed a lot of needles. Last few storms, some wind, just causes pine cones. And I've got some big ponderosa pines. I think junipers do the same thing. Not quite as egregious in the gardens because pine needles, I mean, a six, eight inch needle off of ponderosa is different than a you know, half inch juniper shedding its, its some needles. This is very common. It's not a problem. It's a seasonal thing. They have this, a lot of needles that drop and then, then some seasons less. Uh, but don't let those needles or that debris bury your gardens, especially flowers that are underneath them. So I've got hookahs or, or coral bells, another name for that, underneath these. We've got some shrubs like forsythia, lilacs, butterfly bush. I didn't want the needles to suffocate or drown out the gardens underneath. And so you need to rake those up some. So I, I don't mind a few needles, an inch or two, but a lot of them, 
not so good. They could suffocate plants underneath them. This is a design. This is how natives work. They're doing this on purpose to drown out all competition. So all the water and nutrients underneath where their roots are, it's all there. So they're purposely trying to defend their territory. Well, okay, it can be kind of messy if you got a deck or something underneath them. You always have to rake up and blow off and that kind of stuff. I took those leaves, those needles, and I spread them on other portions of the gardens. So I use it as top dressing. So on average, a three inch layer of organic material over your flower beds, between around your roses. I put them in my hedgerows, uh, cotoneasters, to keep the weeds down keep the sun off from sun burning, to keep it from heaving right now. The soil is freezing at night, thawing during the day, and it's, it's, it gets this fluffy look. Rocks will actually emerge out of the ground. They just, it's, we call it soil heaving, and it can heave the roots of your plants as well and break them, so it does damage. Uh, don't, don't allow that to happen. So to add some mulch, I happen to take pine needles it's a great mulch. A little bit is good. An 8, 9, 10, 12-inch 12 12 layer suffocates. So a little bit's good. So I took those, raked them up underneath the pine trees, and spread them generously around my other plants that are maybe away from the pine trees. Hopefully I'm making sense with all this. Uh, it's also a fire hazard. So if you're in that uh, wildland or, or fire interface, you need to actually think through, how do I keep wildfires down on the ground and keep them from spreading or let the firefighters give them a chance to get ahead of this thing to keep it on the ground don't let the fires jump up into the canopies of these trees well one of the main call it a matchstick i guess it, it creeps across the ground it burns needles so it's a very flammable it's got lots of of oils in the the pine needles they burn very easily very quickly with a large flame. So I want to get those things out. A little bit's good. I don't want eight, nine, a whole big layer of pine needles. So to go through once or twice a year and rake them up, kind of keep them clean, but leave some. Whatever you do, don't take all of that leaf litter or pine needle litter, or you're leaving your plants where they are exposed to soil heaving, to sun burning. It can actually dry out the plant, make them more exposed to bug uh, infestations, uh, to have bark beetle attack your pines, to have scale attack your pinions. This is important. So you want to keep them healthy. So take some of it away, but keep some of it there to protect the roots that it was meant to protect. So work with nature, not against nature. This is where I think sometimes taking rock right up to the edge, right up to the trunk of trees, it first of all, looks unnatural. Secondly, it's not as healthy for your plants, they, per, they like some organic material under the drip line, uh, the, the outer branches of a tree. That's where the roots typically mirror underneath the plant. They like that to be not just rock. They like it to have some organic material. I, I use pine needles. I actually use mostly shredded cedar bark. That's my favorite. But I'll take just regular compost, mulch. Works great. Plants really respond to that, especially your blooming things like lilacs, forsythia, roses, hibiscus, crepe myrtles. You can just go down the line. There's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens that really do well here. So harvest some of that, clean up some of that, then use it in other areas. And you can balance out your garden so they actually perform better for you throughout the year. We're at the leading edge of planting season. And it's time to get that pruning cleaned up. Clean up the gardens, get your pruning done, plant wildflower seeds while you get a chance because there's only like a few weeks left. We're in the peak of the planting season. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. We believe in family, church, community, and friendships here at Waters Garden Center. Waters Garden Companion plants in February are peony, lily of the valley, pinion pines, and Calgary carpet juniper. Calgary carpet juniper shows rich green mounds of juniper beauty that grows ankle high for the perfect ground cover. An ideal choice for low water, low care erosion control on natural banks or to soften that rock lawn. The perfect green nestled between boulders or to soften the top edge of a retaining wall. 
Shop for these Juniper Beauties in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And back in the studio, Lisa Waters Lane, coming back with just inspiration. What are some things we can plant now that will beautify our gardens? She comes each week. Uh, that uh, just to share inspiration. So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. So what inspiring things do you have for us today? <laughs> well, I'll show the pretty stuff first because it's already up and blooming and pretty. And the answer is yes, you can put these things in your yard now. Oh, yeah. And they will be fine. Yeah. They like yeah. the cooler weather. So these are our mammoth pansies. So mammoth have those big blossoms with the little monkey faces in them. It's kind of very much your traditional pansy does very very well here um, just a super little plant for the cool weather when you need a little bit of brightness on your drab days pansies definitely do it so what's the difference between pansies viola johnny jump ups <laughs> all the different they come up by a lot of different names right. what's the difference well between pansies all of them? are usually bigger have a bigger blossom okay, to them like bigger that. kind of a bigger plant usually bigger leaves plant itself is going to get bigger. Your violas, which Johnny Jump Hopes are part of that viola. So violas reseed easier, um, smaller bloom, smaller leaves, smaller plant. But more blossoms. More blossoms. They still love the cool weather. It's great to mix into your pots. You can put pansies and violas together. Of course you can. Um, but yeah, both like the cool temperatures. We'll be happy till we start getting really hot. Like you know, I tell folks, I'm telling clients or I'm teaching garden classes right now mm -hmm. um, because of the extremes of the mountains mm -hmm. uh, these are these will love growing right um, I would say don't start out early spring or late winter whatever this is don't start out now with tiny six packs right the the bigger the roots mm -hmm. the more success you're going to have right uh, so, so this is a gallon size. It's mm -hmm. uh, twelve ninety nine. So it's very, it's big. It's probably at least a foot fourteen inches across. It's got a dozen blooms on it already. You'd be better off planting this in the yard because the roots are established enough right. where it will actually fill in faster mm -hmm. and it'll take the extremes right. better. Whereas a six pack, it'll just sit there and it won't really grow very much until like May. Right. So you're better off early. And then once you get into the actual, like uh, May, June, July, summer, the, the out of frost, then you can go to the six pack, you know, mm -hmm. marigold, six pack, petunia, six pack, right. six packs, that, that six cells in a pack. But early on, four inch gallons, or you're going to have far more success by doing that right. uh, than going with smaller. I would say the same thing throughout the season. So mm -hmm. tomatoes or if you're planting peppers, it's better to go with a four inch. The bigger the root, mm -hmm. trees, the bigger the root, the more success. So we look at that with our returns, fruit trees. The five gallons come back more often. Than a 15 gallon, just mm -hmm. because the root mass is so much larger. Got a little more forgiveness. Very much in. so. So anyway, I didn't mean to go there, but this is a nice yeah, big you, full plant. You, it's glorious. <laughs> yes. So here's another really beautiful big one. So this is Snapdragon. So this one is Snaptastic, Snaptastic Orange Flame. That's and it is beautiful. <laughs> so it's kind of a pinky orange yellow. It's Really, really pretty. One of the prettier ones. It's pink with a orange center. Very yeah. unusual. Mm -hmm. It's a new color. Right. It is mm -hmm. a new color. But snapdragons are another cool season plant. Very happy in these cooler temperatures. Also very animal resistant. Oh, yeah. So if you've got the deer, the javelina, the bunnies, this is the kind of color you want to go with, not the pansy so much. Um, but snapdragons are amazing. They'll frequently reseed themselves, and you'll have them coming up in the yard 
What are you looking at? That little white thing. It's showing up oh. on camera. It's <laughs> just a little piece of paper is all it is. Oh. So my bad. <laughs> Thought it was a bug. For you folks watching the vlog, the video <laughs> piece of this, now it's better. <laughs> yeah. So we have our cool season set. We got pansies, viola, snapdragons, dusty miller, yeah. uh, poppies. We got some columbine in. Yeah. Uh, we got some rainbow ascot euphorbia. So some of those early season things, they're really starting to show up now. And it's a good time to be hunting them down. But it's going to snow this week or it snowed. I had three inches. Mm -hmm. That's okay. These guys it's like okay. that. They they'll, like, they'll they prefer be that. okay with it. Yeah. I have a day or two. Of they're like, oh, but they pop right out yeah. of it. And yeah. A little bit of sun. They're off and going. Yeah. Definitely. So I just wanted to bring those in for pretty color. But some of the other stuff that we've gotten in for spring blooming, which is still, are you going to stick that thing? No, I was going to try. But <laughs> people that face. are watching the videos are not going to like it. We'll get it off camera. So there we go. Uh, so the things that are spring bloomers, um, many of which are dormant right now. But you get them in your yard, you get them planted, and they're going to wake up in your yard. They're going to be beautiful, and you're going to get to enjoy the spring blossoms. Yeah. So definitely we got to start with forsythia. Oh yeah. Because that's kind of the first thing to bloom in the in the spring yard. So forsythia is that shrub that has the blossoms on it first. It's bright yellow. So it really just shows up out there in the yard, bright yellow, puts its green leaves on later. But it's a terrific plant for here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also very animal resistant. Yeah. So we don't need to worry about deer and those kind of things. Avelina, pack rats, right. none, mm -hmm. none of them eat the porcupines. They don't eat forsythia. Yes, that yeah. is true. So we've got four different ones and they kind of go have four different heights. Four different so, forsythias? We do. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. So we have springtime forsythia, which is the smallest one. So it gets about two by three, somewhere in there. So more of a dwarf. Uh, great if you got a little, you want to put it in front of some other shrubs. If you're just yeah. throwing some color out into your perennial bed, just a good one to put in there. Magical gold, which gets about four by four. Then we have show off, which gets about five by five. Okay. And then the last one is the northern gold, which That's gets about boy. eight by five. Yeah. So we got one for every size that you could possibly want. Why commit to pruning? <laughs> When you can just plant the right size and right. never do anything. Yeah. And they're all equally as hardy. You oh, know, yeah. Just kind of just put them in the right place and you're good. So <laughs> they're wonderful out in the yard. People should put them in. They're they're pretty foolproof. There's really not a lot that goes wrong with them. Yeah. Um, lilacs, another one that's dormant right now, but is going to be blooming here pretty soon. And that's another one we have different sizes of. So we have Little Darling, which gets about four by four. It just sounds cute. It does sound cute. It's kind of a lavender bloom to it. Uh, we have Scent and Scentability, which is a pink lilac, but the fragrance on it is amazing. Oh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful one. And then we have the Deep Purple Bloomerang. So Bloomerang is one that blooms usually at least twice a year, sometimes three conditions are right. Still has a really nice lilac smell to it, even though it's a smaller shrub. Um, and But the blooms are just really beautiful. It's kind of hip high by hip wide. Mm -hmm. hip Repeat wide. blooming. <laughs> well, maybe hip. Who's hips? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go three by three are by three by three. Are you talking about my hips? Yeah. <laughs> nope. I would never. I know better. What so, did I just walk into? There you go. Then, of course, we have the big ones. We've got Lavender Lady, Sensation, Pocahontas, Blue Skies. Uh, we're going to have the traditional old-fashioned grandma's purple, the yeah. common purple. Um, and, and there again, lilacs do really well here. Every yard should have at least three. I mean, it's just they have so many colors, so many sizes. Mm -hmm. They do so, they're drill hardy. Right. Animals don't eat them. They're great. And both of those, for Cynthia and Lilac, love the full set. Oh, yeah. So no problem putting them out in the full sun. Uh, I think we have time. We'll sneak yeah. in. We also got in. So these guys like shade. So if you have a shady part in your yard or uh, under a tree where it's getting more shade. So your rhododendrons. Perfect. And yeah. your azaleas. Those have huge buds right now on them. I was yeah. looking at them. They're, they're magnificent. <laughs> so some of the big roadies are like the Tribly and the... Um, Jean-Marie, they're kind of a red blossom to them. And they're going to get, what do you say the average? Really I've gets seen here? them out in Hazley's from the old established ones above head height. Yeah. Easily. They will get big. I mean, yeah. if you just let them go, they'll go easily up mm -hmm. seven, seven, six, seven feet. Right. 
Right. So we got some red ones. We've got some that are more purple, like the Florence Park is more purple. Um, and then we have some that are a little bit smaller. So if you don't have a great big space, but you still run a, a pretty roadie out there, um, the PJM is one that's kind of a purpley lavender one. That's a pretty one. Uh, we got the, I always say this wrong, Rap. Rapapo, Rapaho, Rapaho. Rapaho. I always say it wrong. If you just say it with confidence, no one's going to verify. I mean, they're <laughs> jumping on the website to go look to see how you pronounce uh, it. You might be surprised. <laughs> um, so those are definitely smaller. So they're about a three by three at maturity, and the leaf is smaller on them. Beautiful bloom still. We are out of time, Lisa. Okay. Your list goes on and on. So Ken and Lisa Lane, <laughs> the Mountain Gardeners, thank you for inspiring us. Get those things in the ground now. Be right back after this. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Waters Garden Companion Plants of February are Peony, Calgary Carpet Juniper, Lily of the Valley, and Pinion Pines. Pinion Pine have thick evergreen needles providing year-round beauty and summer shade. It's a local native that blend equally well in a modern or Mediterranean-style landscape. Go ahead, enjoy the buttery-rich pine nuts from your own backyard. You'll have plenty of nuts, and pine are deer and javelina proof. Shop the most trees in Prescott by store or online at watersgardencenter.com. Hi, Elisa with the plants of the week and our Austrian pine. We have instantaneous trees just in and ready for planting. This pine has the same long needles as our ponderosa pine without all the problems. And these trees are really big and bold. This is the fastest growing up of pines and lots of sizes to choose from. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love big, bold pines, they love to shop. We believe searching Waters plants are better than a Google search at Waters Garden Center. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. All right, this has been the show for gardening for newcomers or just new to new to gardening in the mountains of Arizona, trying to up our game. We've covered our zones, how to plant. Right now, I want to cover nutrients, watering, and the pH level, which is so funky here in this part of the Southwest. We have something that no one else in the country has. And so if you're just reading Fine Guard Magazine or Organics or... or Home and home and home beautiful, whatever the national magazines are, or HGTV, they're going to tell you, oh, you've got acidic soil. We need to raise the pH to make it more alkaline. And we never, ever want to do that. And there's two things that they tell you to do that are detrimental to your gardens here in the in the Arizona mountain area. One, uh, add lime to your soil. Lime sweetens the soil. Have you heard this? And so it raises the pH where our water is so alkaline. If you simply take the hose off your tap and water your gardens, it's going to be your gardens, your soil will be naturally high in pH. I, it'll naturally go to seven to eight pH, neutral or the perfect pH. Those of you that have had spas or, or hot tubs or, or, or pools, you're always checking your pH. Because if you get in the water and the pH is off, you'll you'll feel like your skin's coming off your body. Or the plants, when the pH gets off, their the roots, the bark wants to come off their roots. And so it affects in the same way. Only they can't get up out of this out of the hot tub and get away from it and go take a shower and hose down. And they have to stay there and live in this. So if the pH is really critical with plants, this the neutral is 6.5. So I'm just quoting the book. I've never seen anyone have that kind of pH in the mountains of Arizona because our water is typically going to be in the sevens, eights. If you're on a well, I've seen as high as 9.3 pH. The, the pH meter goes from 1 to 10, so 9.3 is virtually, I mean, nothing will live in that. And that's the water. You need to correct that. And so if you add lime, it takes an already high pH and puts it off the charts. Here we want to add soil Sulfur. Sulfur does the opposite of lime. It lowers the pH, makes it more acidic. And so every spring, when I fertilize my entire yard, I add 
the fertilizer and I also go through and I add a whole other layer of sulfur. So little tiny sulfur pellets. It looks like sulfur. You spread it around as water hits it, it lowers the pH. It's really a game changer to increase your fragrance. It makes your plants greener, so they're more, they're just less yellow, more green. It makes the fragrance come out. The flowers are bigger and brighter. That's what your pH does for you. That, and there are no real nutrients in your ground. This is very difficult for you folks in the Midwest. You've, gar- you've gardened in Indiana or Illinois or, or anywhere in the Midwest, the South. You just have this rich topsoil that's eight feet deep. We don't have topsoil. And so there's no real organics. That topsoil is what adds or holds your nutrients. Well, you can go through for years and never fertilize if you've got great topsoil. Here, we have none. So what you'll find is you have to fertilize more regularly, more often. And please, for the love love of gardening, stay away from miracle Grow. Please do not introduce that garbage into your yard. It will sterilize your soil. It does more damage than good. In fact, I've stopped selling it. Here at Waters Garden Center, at least, I no longer offer that product at our our garden center. And that's like the number one seller of all garden products. It's easy money. You chuck it on an end cap, it just naturally walks off the shelf. I'm just not going to subject my my gardeners that I help to that kind of detrimental gardening. It's a salt-based fertilizer, and so it raises that pH, it adds salt, it clogs up the soil. It just is not good. What you really want to go for, if you don't have a lot of nutrients naturally occurring in your in your backyard landscape, is you want to use a granular fertilizer and you want it to be slow release. Now, we go so far as, because of what our company, what, what Lisa and I stand for, we love organics. We want natural products. We've made our own granular, slow release, organic fertilizer. It's a 744 all-purpose food. The main thing is if you're going to go synthetic or chemical-based, make sure it says slow release. Don't just buy a, a, a you know ammonium sulfate or Scott's turf builder stuff. If you're going to do that. Some of those are, are still chemical-based, but they release very quickly, like in 30, 30 days or less. It's all released. You want something that takes three months, four months, five months to break down and release. If you do that, as, as it rains, as it as you irrigate, it slowly breaks down and just trickles fruit nutrients through that soil much longer, you'll find you have a much, much healthier plant in the long run by, by using a granular fertilizer. I say on the holidays, you're thinking Easter, that's your spring fertilizer. The 4th of July, that's right before the rainy seasons, that's, that's your summer fertilizing. And then Halloween. Almost always, the fall colors around, it's looking good, the maples are red, the aspens have turned gold. That's your cue, fall fertilizer. If you're using a granular food that breaks down slowly, you'll find you have got more apples and you know what to do with more peaches. You've got the greenest evergreens. You've got roses and lilacs that just load up with flowers. Now, you'll have a better looking landscape by doing that. So get a good quality fertilizer, And then for my own gardens, this is my take. This is what I do. For my spring fertilizer, this one you'll probably need to take notes, or I've got a handout here at the garden center. It's free. If if you're driving right now, drive by here, and we'll give you the handout on on the four steps to proper fertilizing. In the spring, I add soil, sulfur, I already told you why, and the all-purpose plant food. I'll add that usually in the month of March. Sometime I'll put that out there. Just a touch early yet. Although the second you see that first forsythia bloom, the daffodils blooming, that's your cue. First bit of growth in spring, fertilize. Uh, Sulfur and food. In the summer, I take the same exact food and I'll add humic acid or they call it humic is the granular name. It just helps stressed out plants. June is so hot, the plants do get stressed out. No matter how much you water they just get stressed. And then the rains come in July and everything takes a breath. But what humic does, it actually increases the the root mass. And so if the plants were stressed or they got overwatered or underwatered or you traveled on that Panama Canal cruise and you came back and the system just c- collapsed on you and the plants are all stressed out, um, the humic will actually interact with the roots, encourage larger root mass and now the fertilizer can can that the roots can take up that nutrient. In the fall, all I do is the the fertilizer. That's it. Uh, I do recommend if you have a lot of evergreens, 
that you do you do a New Year's fertilizing as well because evergreens here they tend to turn yellow in the winter. Um, also, I don't recommend that schedule for your native plants, but your natives do need some care. If you're out in that, some of you bought your lot because of that beautiful pristine pinion pine or juniper or ponderosa grove. If you've got some really nice native plants, they are stressed out. They were growing there for hundreds of years, but that was before your subdivision went in, before you cut some of the roots to put your foundations, your driveways in. The, its environment has been altered, if nothing else, by all the the, the island effect or the, the heating up of that neighborhood. All the asphalt on the roads, the shingles heats up your neighborhood. So now it's living in a neighborhood that's now five degrees warmer than it was used to. And then the drainage has been altered. I would recommend fertilizing your native plants once. And I would use it in the spring of the year. I take that all-purpose plant food, that 744 food, and I would fertilize those plants that are natural out there, especially your, your evergreens. They really will benefit from that. If a, a healthy ponderosa pine can take on the Ips beetle or the bark beetle, the uh, a, a ponderosa, a pinion pine that's out there naturally growing, it can take on the scale that shows up if you just keep it healthy. I would also recommend watering those plants, those natives, once a month in the spring, starting at least April, May, and June. I would water it once a month. Take a soaker hose, soak it around there, and just turn it on for half a day. A hydrated native can take on whatever comes its way. Uh, even though you severed some roots, something happened, it can still stay healthy and be viable. Uh, but, but left on its own, they, they're now in a different environment, different universe, and they've got to adjust to that. You can help them easily with just fertilizing and watering periodically just, just in the spring of the season. Those are my tips on nutrients for your landscape. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Hi, Ken here with the finds of the week and our Deodor Cedars. A standalone tree so beautifully shaped it's referred to as the Christmas tree. Fastest growing of the evergreen trees used for quick screens, windbreaks, and privacy. Graceful arches sweep through the landscape in colors of blue to green from the stately tree. And evergreen lovers dream for fast, thick growth. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love majestic evergreens, they love to shop. We believe you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think at Waters Garden Center. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch, but we have the solution. At Waters, we've organized our houseplants from A to Z for the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom. With experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest houseplants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center, where people who love bright green houseplants, they love to shop, found in Prescott. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now, this show broadcasts all over northern Arizona, and so there's different elevations. There's north, south, east, west facing. That actually has more to do with your gardening than even elevation does. So an eastern exposure is kinder. It's easier to garden in. The west exposure is also pretty kind. South, it's just hot. And north, there's still snow on the ground, plenty of it. Now, as you see snow on the ground, so to give you a, a to help you figure out how much moisture your landscape has had, about six inches of snow equals one inch of rain. And so it looks like at our house, we had about seven, eight inches of snow. So that's a really good snow. So an inch of rain or inch of snow or an inch, seven inches of snow, that's, that's going to hydrate the landscape. That's really beneficial. The beauty of, 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 of snow is that it slowly percolates into the ground so it doesn't run off most of it most of it gets into the ground so the plants really have time to take it up they're also actively absorbing moisture right now because the ground was thawed before it snowed 
and just snow kind of insulates the ground so it didn't freeze the plants are still actively pushing up roots and picking up that moisture right now and so the sap is running up and down the trees really well right now so it's a beautiful time to fertilize i mean the, I, I actually fertilized my yards right before the snow i said i'm going to take advantage of this moisture i'm going to put it underneath the snow and so it percolates and it just takes that that food and gets it right to the plant so you'll get larger flower buds on your blooming plants in spring lilacs forsythia your fruit trees grapes berries your flowers like pansies they'll all do better one thing that uh, oh on that same um, snow thing. That snow, when you see, uh, let's say, eight inches of, of snow on, on the ground, you can visualize that's about how far down in the, in the ground that moisture will penetrate. So about an inch of rain goes down about six inches of soil. That helps you, for you folks that water by hand, this is a real good uh, measurement for you. And so an inch of water will penetrate about six inches of soil. So when you see that, that snow, it kind of it equates to, yeah, it'll go down about that far into your gardens, which is where most of the roots are. Most roots on trees, even the biggest trees, they're only 18 inches deep, maybe 24, no more. So the, the roots go sideways, picking up moisture and food throughout the landscape. Even the big natives, they're going sideways because this is how our moisture works in the mountains of Arizona. It's, it's fast, it's furious, it's quick. And when it does, when there's moisture, you better be ready to pick it up right now. Don't wait. Don't let it seep down and, and, and percolate. So, okay, take advantage. If you didn't get your fertilizer on before the snow, take advantage of it now. As it melts, the ground is moist. It's just such an opportune time. Your daffodils. I've got, uh, we've, we've got some uh, nectarines, uh, red buds. We're starting to see some cracking, some color showing up on the flowers, which is kind of exciting. You know, it's going to be March next week. This is, it's spring in three weeks, so it's, it's about on time. It's about at the right track. Do not worry about, especially your flowers, pansies, kale. I've got uh, daffodils are up. It's got to be at least eight, nine, ten inches and actively growing. When it snows and it's cold like this, they just slow down. They don't get damaged. Don't worry about them. Don't try to cover them. It's not worth the energy because they don't need it. They just slow down and as soon as it melts, it comes right back like it was like it was nothing. So it just comes right back at it. So for you folks that are new to mountain gardening, don't sweat the frost, the snow, the cold. These early spring plants, they like that. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. We love talking and helping fans of the show. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. We believe retirement means more time to garden and plants make you happier at Waters Garden Center. If you enjoy this show and would like to hear more, please subscribe to The Mountain Gardener wherever you like to listen to podcasts. And if you'd like even more garden tips, tricks, and helpful advice, please check out my website at watersgardencenter.com for classes, videos, and more or my online garden center at top10plants.com. Throughout the week, Lisa and I can be found here at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.